Hey everyone, Attorney Sam here. Thanks so much for watching. This is going to be part two of my Instagram live session with Clement Pierlot, who is the chef de cave for Champagne Pomery. In this video, we're going to focus only on Champagne. And so Mr. Pierlot is going to be walking us through the rich heritage and tradition of Champagne Pomery. He will also be discussing some exciting visitation and tourism opportunities, as well as leading us through a virtual tasting of the flagship Brut Royale Champagne, which is a compelling value at only around $40 US, and also the Tete de Cuvée, the Cuvée Louise. So you'll want to be sure to stick around for that. If you enjoy these videos, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss the next one. I'll be coming out with these at least uh, once a week or so. And also please go ahead and smash that like button. Thanks so much, and let's get right into it. Today I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Clement Pierlot, who is the cellar master for Champagne Pomery. Uh, bonsoir. Bonsoir. Hi, Jim. How are you? I'm doing fine, fine. Excellent. Very, very well. Very hot in, in Champagne today. Oh, is it? In Texas too, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Yes, I'm very happy to to meet you for the first time and very happy to, to talk with you uh, of Pomery and with Pomery. Excellent, thank you very much. And so, uh, just so everyone knows the agenda for today, we'll be starting out by hearing uh, Mr. Pilot talking about the uh, rich heritage and tradition of Champagne Pomery, and then he'll tell us a little bit about what he does as a cellar master and all the hard work and dedication it takes to produce champagne. Uh, then we're going to be tasting through three wines and have the Brut Royal sparkling, uh, the Brut Royal Champagne from Champagne Pomer. Champagne, yes. Yeah, Champagne. And then we're going to finish <laughs> on a high note with the Tete de Cuvée, the Cuvée Louise, and uh, hear about why that's such a special champagne and uh, why everyone should try that one for sure if they haven't already. And with that, I think uh, Mr. Pirillo, I'll turn things over to you. And if you could please introduce our Champagne Palmer and yes. uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the heritage and tradition. First of all, I uh, just would like to introduce you to the, to the room where we are, because we are in the middle of the estate. It's a very large estate of more than 50 hectares. And we are in the castle and we are uh, in the pop room. So I don't know if you know the the Champagne Pop. Uh, it's um, a trendy uh, quarter uh, launched by Pomery uh, in '99, and we are in the in the pop room where you can find all the pops we we launched uh, last uh, um, 20 years. Uh, if you want, I can maybe show you a bit. Uh, the, oh sure. If it's, uh, yes, just to show you the room. It's uh, you can find all the all the pops uh, from all the all over the world, um, and you may find uh, the American one <laughs> just up there. <laughs> yeah, oh, so it's a very interesting room. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's so. a great room to uh, to be doing this. Room. <laughs> So, um, talking about Pomery and the history, um, the house uh, has been founded in 1836, uh, so a long time ago, uh, by a man called Narcisse Grenot. That's why on the bottle, uh, if you take a bottle of Pomery, you will uh, see that uh, there is, of course, Pomery everywhere, but you will see uh, another guy here, uh, um, Grenot. So, Grenot was, was the first to quit the... The company in 1836, it was very, very small, um, because you have to know that uh, before 1850, uh, the Champagne region was selling only uh, 8 million of our bottles. It was very, very little. Uh, in 1836, he, he made a joint venture with uh, Mr. Pomery, uh, and it was the uh, house Pomery and Grenoble. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Pomery died two years after, in uh, 1858. So we don't know very well Mr. Pomery because uh, we know uh, much more the widow Pomery, Madame Pomery, because uh, when she took the control of the company, she was very young, uh, 39, and she developed uh, everything. Um, she made a kind of revolution in Champagne, uh, and um, she started by selling around 30,000 bottles, and when she died, the house I was selling more than two millions of bottles. It was uh, the first arrows at this time at, um, at the end of the 19th century. So, 
yes, already a revolution in terms of um, of sales and in terms of taste because uh, she she made also a revolution in the taste of champagne because she she had the the the, the genius to to imagine a new a new way of uh, tasting champagne. Um, she was hearing the the markets. Uh, the English market was very important at this time because in, in the 19th century, uh, the, the British Empire uh, made the trend, you know. So she was very uh, attentive to the um, to the trend in the UK, and and she knew that uh, the English people uh, wanted to um, to drink uh, the champagne drier and drier. So she worked a lot um, with the cellar master at this time uh, on a new uh, way to. To, to produce champagne and to to uh, remove the sugar. So it was uh, really a, a long way because she's starting to think about it in uh, 1867 because we, we have some uh, males at, at this time uh, um, uh, from from the UK, from the sales director uh, talking about uh, about that. And um, the, the real success of the Brut of Pomery was in 1874. So it took 10 years to really um, put everything in line to, to achieve the goal because it was very difficult. Um, I think a lot of people at this time wanted to, to make the champagne drier, but it was just impossible or too difficult because um, uh, the, the sugar was here to to kind of hide something, uh, maybe too much acidity, uh, less ripeness, uh, uh, not, not so much uh, aging. So she had to, to change everything. So she worked uh, on the vineyard, she bought vineyards, she worked with the wine growers by purchasing the, the grapes, uh, not uh, in the press center, but directly on the vines. The idea was to, to take the risk uh, of the harvest um, instead of the wine grower. And she, she can decide the, the precise date of the picking and, and have the good ripeness. And, and she built the estate uh, from 1868 to 1878. She built the estate, a magnificent estate with the castle. Uh, it, it's very big. Um, we, we always say that it's a, a, an homage to, to the British uh, uh, people because it's a, a British style. Uh, but um, it was moreover for place, needed place to age. Uh, because at this time the wine was made in barrels, in oak barrels, and we needed a lot of. When you want to age more the wine, you need place. You need place for the barrels, and you need place for the bottles. So she created a lot of galleries uh, because she bought uh, a, a hill in uh, just at the border of France with a lot of um, Gallo Roman choke carries, and the, the genius was to to link all the choke carries uh, with galleries. And to use uh, the material of the galleries to to fill up the choke carries to have the same level everywhere, 30 meters uh, below earth to have a, a natural constant temperature. So uh, with these galleries, it's 18 kilometers. It's, it's crazy. Um, we can store 30 millions of bottles. Uh, so you have to imagine she was selling uh, less than one million, and she was thinking, "I, I have the capacity to store thirty millions of bottles." Oh wow! Uh, but the idea was, I, I can edge uh, as long as I want, and I know to remove the sugar, I have to work better in the vineyard, and to edge um, on lees more. Uh, so in 1874, uh, she. She had everything in line, uh, the champagne she wanted, uh, with the finesse, the freshness, uh, everything she had in mind was okay in 1874. And so we created the Brut and after we, we, we put uh, the, the name Nature on the wine. Um, nature is not um, a trendy word because uh, we have we have evidence of uh, the word Nature on all wines since the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, yeah, it's a global uh, listing uh, for for the Champagne region. But uh, to 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 have this listing, uh, there were three uh, very precise places uh, for the, um, the world heritage: uh, the Avenue de Champagne in Epernay, um, uh, the historical slopes from Ailly uh, to Auvillé. With uh, Ovilé Abbey, and the third one, or well, first one, <laughs> uh, was the Butte Saint Nicaise, where we are, uh, especially for with Pomery, because uh, 
the most uh, gigantic uh, galleries are here and and with the estate and the castle uh, it's a very, a very uh, important place for champagne region it, it helps to have the, the world heritage uh, listing for for the region yeah and so if people want to visit there's uh, tourism opportunities as well and you're only about a 45 minute train ride from paris is that right yes 45 minutes you're right uh, very close to the station so uh, when we built the estate in the 19th century, we were outside the city. Now uh, we are inside, but we are at the, at the entrance of the city, so it's very easy to reach. Um, we we are welcoming visitors uh, all the year. We are open all the year. Uh, of course, uh, we have currently it's more difficult, but we are we are open. We are um, we were the first house to reopen the doors uh, very quickly. Uh, because we want people to come here. Because uh, if you want to understand Pomeroy, you need to come to see uh, to see the estate. It's it's so much different when you, when you you have seen the place. Uh, so you can make different tours. You can make only the the, the cellars. You can you can have a combination with uh, with the vineyard or with the winery uh, or with the, um, we have uh, the Villa de Moiselle which is one of the, the best example of uh, new art uh, in France. And shifting gears a little bit, uh, for those who are new to uh, Champagne Pomery, how would you describe the house style? The house style is really the, the style Madame Pomery um, uh, uh, thought about uh, in the 19th century. Uh, all is about uh, uh, finesse uh, and freshness. Uh, so it's very easy, easy to, to say, but... Uh, uh, everything is, it's a lot of very small details to, to reach, uh, this goal. Uh, we, 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 we want wine that uh, doesn't, uh, tire uh, your palate. Uh, we want very fresh wine. Uh, but, um, uh, very fresh wine doesn't mean simple wine. It means, uh, uh, very straight from the beginning to the end of the tasting. Uh, but we have volume, we have complexity, but we, we really want, uh, the finesse above all. And as a chef de cave, uh, what are your responsibilities, and what is it that you uh, that you do? Uh, when you are chef de cave, you are a kind of a keeper of the temple, uh, so you are uh, responsible of everything. Uh, so you have to, you need people to help you. Um, but the idea is to to look after the quality. So depending on the chef de cave, depending on the house, you, the the role can be a bit different. Um, Depending on if the house has a, the vineyard, a vineyard or not, uh, we have a, a, a large vineyard, so I am also in charge of the vineyard, so it was very important for me to, to link the vineyard and the wine. So uh, I would say from the pruning of the vines, we are like we are doing today, uh, everything uh, linked to the, to the brand. Lots of responsibilities then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of the... Uh, the winemaking itself, uh, in the cellar, in the blending, and so forth. How many people do you have on your team? For for, for uh, you have to understand where there is a, a, a panel, a testing panel, uh, with a different geometry regarding the, the stage the stages. Um, we we have uh, twenty winemakers or agronomists uh, in the company and depending on the stages we can uh, we can have uh, different panels be uh, six or seven for the uh, fermentation testing but for the blend we are uh, currently we are free because you need it's very when you you change the chef de cave uh, the chef de cave it's like a trainer uh, a soccer trainer you need you need your team your staff and uh, it's a long uh, process to 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 have the, conf the confidence, the trust of uh, of your colleagues, of your team, and you need to trust them too, uh, because uh, the testing is uh, not uh, an exact science. Um, you can be better one day to another, so the team is very important. So I have a deputy cellar master uh, with a woman, so it, it was very important for me to. Uh, to have a woman in the in the panel because, uh, uh, as you know, a lot of women uh, drink champagne, so I think it's important to have <laughs> um, their sensibility. Um, and we, we don't test uh, the same, so it's very interesting to to share. Uh, and uh, I have also um, a, a winemaker um, who is more in charge of the sparkling wine all over the world, but he is also in the panel for for Pomeroy because. Uh, we, we talk about Louis Pomery, but the idea in Louis Pomery is to express the terroir of the other regions, but 
keeping the style of Pomri. So it's, it's important that the, the winemaker in charge of Louis Pomri is in the panel of the, for the blend of Pomri too. Okay, great. You mentioned the stages of the, uh, the champagne. Did I read correctly that there are as many as 18 stages in your production process? I didn't call <laughs> them. <laughs> I showed you. There's, there's lots of different stages. It goes through lots of yeah, different... But, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of, but um, um, there are stages more important than others, but uh, as I told you, it's a lot of small details. And when you change everything in the house, it can change the style. Uh, so it's a lot of details on, on, on in every stage. Um, if you add the stages in the vineyard, it's more than 18. But uh, from the press uh, to the, the labeling, I think, yes, 18 is... Uh, is uh, maybe a good, a good number yeah, <laughs> I have <agree>. to count. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's a lot to count. So. <laughs> hey, and then try the uh, the Brut Roy. Uh, this okay. is, of course, the uh, the flagship wine, is it not? Yeah, yes, exactly. Is that original yeah. name that you were mentioning earlier? Yes. So, yes, it's really the, the flagship of the, of the brand. Um, the iconic cuvee, because it's, uh, it's really the, the modern vision of uh, the first brut in 1874. Uh, it's uh, re really uh, what Madame Pomery wanted in 1874, so it has to be perfect. Uh, it's uh, very widespread in the world. So, um, when you talk about Pomri, you talk about the blue label, the royal blue label, um, because the color is uh, the blue royal, blue de France. Um, so you, you, you can find it everywhere in the world, in, in, in New York, in Tokyo, uh, in Paris, and it has to be the same everywhere in the world. So, um, and when you want to know a company, you always take the non-vintage, um, so it's really the key to enter the world of Pomri. So uh, uh, we will press uh, Cuvée Louise after, of course. Cuvée Louise is a prestige Cuvée, it has to be uh, uh, the absolute purity. But what is very important for Champagne House is to have a non-vintage uh, which has to be perfect. Uh, so that's about Royal. Um, it's uh, uh, the, the Pomri representation of the, of the Champagne area. We are working on 40 villages, 40 crew, uh, with a very high uh, rate of classification. Uh, but what is important more than the, the, the rate, you have premier cru, grand cru, of course, but uh, it's a link to the land. We have our, our own vineyard, but we work with wine growers too. And you have to know that uh, a lot of wine growers are very committed to the brand. Uh, we have wine growers about, uh, selling uh, their grapes uh, since three or four generations. So. But the part of the style is you have we have very uh, uh, very strong link with the wine growers too. Um, so it's a, a blend of the three uh, champagne varieties: Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Meunier. You have one third uh, of each variety. Uh, so the idea is to find the, the balance between the three varieties. Um, what is important on non-vintage is you can work on, on different years, of course, and it's really uh, the know-how of, uh, of a champagne house is to is the use of the reserve wines. And what makes uh, a, a champagne house strong is the collection of reserve wine because it's very difficult to to keep uh, a lot of reserve wine. You need a big winery, you need uh, it's a lot of money to keep uh, the wine so long. Uh, in the Brut Royal, you have 30% minimum of uh, reserve wines. Uh, we have two types of reserve wines. We have wines separated by, by quality, uh, by, by variety, by village. You can have a, a Cramont uh, from uh, 20 to 2012 uh, Chardonnay, but we have also um, the blend of the year before. But we, are, we always keep the blend of uh, the Brut Royal, the Apanage Blanc de Blanc, um, the Pop. Uh, we always keep uh, the blend, a part of the blend. Uh, you make the blend and we keep 10%, 15% of the blend in reserve wines. Uh, it's very important because when you make the blend, you always have the blend of the year before or the blend to, to, to compare, and you also have, uh, for example, in the Brut Royal, you have 15% of the Brut Royal of the year before. So that's a guarantee of the uh, consistency of the style. Great. Does the uh, reserve wine tend to be more uh, Chardonnay than the other, or is it uh, 
the reserve line equal parts as well. Equal parts, equal parts. Less Meunier because we we always keep more Chardonnay and Pinot Noir than Meunier because the Meunier. Um, but uh, if, if you have friends who, who likes Meunier, which maybe not, uh, they, they won't like me. But um, <laughs> maybe the the, the Meunier edge uh, um, more quick than than the Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So the idea on Rosa wine is to keeping more. Uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but uh, if uh, we have a very nice tank of Meunier, we will keep it uh, too, of course. Okay, so a good way to say it is uh, the Pinot, uh, Pinot Meunier is better when it's younger, so so you tend not to age that one as much. Well, that, that's the idea uh, in, the, in the blend, in the non-vintage, uh, with, um, um, I would say short, but it's not short aging, because uh, on Brut Royal you have a minimum three years of aging on lease, so it's not short. Uh, but also the signature of uh, of, of Pomeroy, it's uh, long aging in our cellar. Um, but uh, when you release a champagne of three years, it's interesting to have money because you need you need fruit, you need roundness. So that's the idea uh, to add money in the blend. And people are always so, asking me for a uh, an exceptional value in champagne, and in explaining that champagne is very expensive. That this is actually a good example of a, a very, very excellent quality champagne that's actually quite affordable at, at about $40 US. Yes, yes. I think so because it's, uh, of course, you are purchasing um, a non-vintage, but you are purchasing uh, a brand, an history, a patrimony, very strong, and um, we work uh, with the same passion on on, Tom, on Brut Royal than on Cuvée Louise, and it's, it's really a lot of work, a lot of details uh, uh, to, to reach this kind of wine. So... Uh, it's not easy to do because uh, if you want to have uh, um, the finesse and uh, a very well balanced wine, and with uh, from the beginning of the tasting to the end, uh, it's there is nothing uh, uh, nothing wrong. Everything is in line. Uh, and the idea when you finish the tasting, you have uh, always this uh, citrus fruit note at the end. You just want to take another glass. You mentioned there's uh, 40 different wines that are. That are part of the blend, mm -hmm. yeah. so very complex. Yes, yep. yeah. The idea is to have forty villages because um, it's interesting uh, in this type of wine to to um, to have a lot of complexity and uh, you. It's difficult to imagine the blend because you you have some white flowers, some citrus fruits of the Chardonnay. You have uh, some notes of red fruits uh, of um, red berries of the Pinot Noir, but you. It's difficult to to find. Um, to find uh, the, the aromas because the idea in this blend is to have a lot of synergy between the varieties, a lot of harmony. So um, you don't want to know which aromas you have. It's just uh, harmony. It's just very pleasant to taste. That's the idea. Yeah. Is all the uh, the champagne that you make aged uh, on site there where you're located there at the estate? We can store um, 30 million of bottles. So we, we have still place if you want to, <laughs> to purchase more. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of capacity. Yeah, yeah everything is made in, in uh, that's, um, you, you have to know that we are still in the same building, um, um, Madame Pomery built in 1878, the same buildings, and everything is made here, the bottling, the winery, uh, uh, and the, the aging in, in our cellar, so everything is made here. Uh, of course, some building has been destroyed during, during World War One, but uh, it has been uh, exactly uh, rebuilt at the same. Well, should we shift gears and go to the uh, uh, Tete de Cuvée, the Cuvée Louise? Avec plaisir. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the bottle, and this is the 2004 vintage. Yes. And it's my understanding this is made up from uh, three Grand Cru vineyards, and it's mostly Chardonnay. Is that right? 65% uh, of Chardonnay, depending on the vintage, but you can, you can have this in mind. For 2004, it's 68%, but the... There is no rule, as you know, uh, um, so the, the truth is in the blend. Um, so, Cuvée Louise is, is very young Cuvée because it's only 40 years old. For us, it's young. Um, it's, uh, it has been created in 79 by the Prince Alain de Polignac, uh, who was the heir of Palin Pomery. Uh, because uh, the prestige Cuvée of Pomery used to be the vintage. Uh, we have a, a Grand Cru vintage. Um, uh, but uh, it's uh, in a standard bottle. So in the 80s, uh, there was a, tra a trend for for shape bottle. So that was that's why we we, we have created the Cuvée Louise. Uh, it's uh, an homage to the daughter of Madame Pomery, Louise, uh, with a very nice bottle. Uh, but the problem was um, for the Prince de Polignac of uh, what 
what can I do to do better than my vintage? It's only Grand Cru, uh, it's an excellent vintage. What can I do to do better? So we work on three villages. So it's an hour, an hour, three villages, three Grand Cru. And um, three Grand Cru, um, which was very linked to Pomerie because we have we own a lot of vineyards in these villages. And, and because... Um, uh, I talk about the style and the finesse, the elegance. Uh, it's probably the most elegant villages in Champagne. So that's what was the idea to, uh, on a vintage, we, we always look for maybe more structure, maybe uh, more full body wine. On Cuvillery, the idea was not, yeah, it was to, to go, uh, further in the purity, uh, further in the, in the elegance. It's really the, the quintessence of the Pomeroy style. So we work on three villages and on a plot selection in our vineyard. So the villages are Cramont and Avise for the Chardonnay. And uh, for the Pinot Noir, it's a very, uh, very nice village uh, because I live there. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, Aï, Aï Champagne. It's one of the only uh, villages to, to have uh, the name Champagne in the name. Uh, Aï Champagne is very famous for, for the red wine, for the... Uh, the king of France wa was drinking uh, uh, IE wine. So the Pinot Noir in IE is very, uh, it's exceptional. So the idea was to, to combine Cramont, Avis and IE uh, for the Cuvée Louise. Yep. And the, um, uh, I was going to say the aromatics yep. on this wine are incredible. I'm getting a lot of uh, even caramel and butterscotch, uh, which, which I don't often get on wines that are uh, 2004. Uh, for example, I get a lot of the same... Uh, aromatic descriptors that I would get on the 1990 Dom Perignon, for example, uh, a lot of that caramel and butterscotch that I really enjoy. Yeah, it's it's um, uh, 2004. Um, it's uh, an amazing year because um, but we we know we know it now because uh, we are the only one to, to sell 2004 at this time. But that's uh, uh, really the signature of Pomerie. We we need a long time uh, to release bottles because. We are working on Grand Cru, on plot selection, on Choki terroir. So it's terroir um, uh, which need a long time to express the potential. And um, the cellars are very cool, 10 degrees. So the aging is longer than uh, in another place. So we need a long time. And 2004 uh, now express uh, still a lot of freshness because it was a, a very... I yield harvest in 2004. Uh, it's, it's incredible. 2004. It's the uh, highest yield we we are ever making in Champagne, uh, but with a quality, uh, an awesome quality. So um, when you read the book in agronomy, uh, everybody told you that it's impossible to make wine with high yield. You can see that it's possible. Uh, nature, nature decide. So, uh, yes, you have a lot of complexity in the wine, a lot of, uh, uh, buttery aromas, of brioche aromas. It's, uh, it's very nice, but you still have some, uh, citrus fruits not, uh, but it's more condai citrus fruit not, uh, condai lemon, uh, for example. Um, and in the mouth, it's, uh, really the expression of the terroir, a lot of minerality, like lace, you know, uh, from the beginning to the end. Oh, it is, and yeah. And the aftertaste is, uh, it's a never-ending never aftertaste, to be honest. We lost Clement, so I'm sure he'll be dialing back in momentarily. But in the meantime, we know that they, uh, the Cuvée Louise is aged 10 to 12 years, so a very, very long time. Uh, most of the Champagne houses now are working on their 2010 vintages or 2009, but uh, it's pretty impressive that they're still selling the, uh, the 2004 uh, in the market as the current release. So, wait, I, didn't, I don't know yeah. what happened. Sure. No, we uh, just lost you briefly, but in the meantime, I was explaining that the, uh, the Cuvée Louise is uh, aged for 10 to 12 years, so a very, very long time. Yes. 